Well, I'm going to start with a little quiz today. It's been a while since I've tried something like this, and here's the quiz. I'm going to give you some quotes, a little snippet of American history. Uh, they're not difficult, but a little snippet of American history, and I want you to just out loud uh, tell me who wrote or said that particular quote. Okay? You got it? You can keep your own score. You get two points for every right answer, and there will be prizes. All right. Here's the first one. Four score and seven years ago. That's an easy one. Everybody got two points in that one. Abraham Lincoln. Bonus question. When did he give that speech, the Gettysburg Address? What year? You're a little foggy on that one. Somebody said it over here. Be honest with yourself. One point for the bonus. 1863. Specifically, November 19th. Did you know that the entire Gettysburg Address was only 271 words? Took him about two minutes to deliver that famous address. Question number two. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. FDR. Okay. If you got that, it's two more points. Um, Bonus question. In what year did he give that speech? Nobody got it last night. Everybody guessed 41, but that's not right. That's what I thought, too. First inaugural address, 1933. No points for any of you for bonus there. (laughs) Question number three. Ask not what your country can do for you. JFK, of course. Give yourself two points if you got that one. That was his inaugural address in 1961. Next question. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong, 1969. Bonus question, what number Apollo mission was that? Apollo, uh, a little foggy. Not 13, that's the movie was made for that one. Apollo 11, give yourself a point for bonus. Double bonus, who were the other astronauts on Apollo 11 besides Neil Armstrong? Buzz Lightyear, no, Buzz, (laughs) Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. Two more points available there if you got them. Finally, only one more. This is the best question of all. Yo, Adrian. (laughs) Rocky Balboa. Bonus question. In what year did the movie Rocky come out? Rocky won. 1975. (laughs) Does that make you feel old? Makes me feel very old. Okay. There were like 16 bonus points available. There were 16 points total. How many points did anybody get all 16? You're supposed to keep track. Anybody? I have probably, I'm going to give you $100,000 bar if you... <laughs> anybody win? Anybody know for sure? Bruce, you look like you won. How about somebody else over here? Ricky, Ricky. Thank you very much for that. Who can catch? Who can catch? Tell me right there. Okay. Don't say I didn't give you anything. Today we begin a study of one of the greatest pieces of literature that we have in human civilization, in all of human history. A letter written 2,000 years ago by a man who never saw an automobile, never used a smartphone, never wrote on a computer, the Apostle Paul. A man whose stunning intellect leaps off the page and who under the guidance of the Holy Spirit wrote words that still endure to today and change hearts and indeed changed the world. Today we begin a series from the New Testament book called Ephesians, Uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and we're calling it Built to Last. Let me give you just a little bit of background before we read the beginning of this great letter. Paul is writing in about 61 AD, which is a little less than 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So think about it this way. How many of you remember the Bears Super Bowl victory in 1985, right? That was more than 30 years ago. So just to give you perspective on history, there are people still living when he wrote this who witnessed the events of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul is under a kind of house arrest in Rome, waiting trial before Caesar. And the city of Ephesus, who he's writing to, was located on the western edge of what we call Turkey today. And at the time of the writing, Ephesus was the fourth largest city in the ancient world. It was a very wealthy city, situated as a port, uh, perfectly located uh, on the trade route from Asia, something like an ancient New York City, think of it that way. So Ephesus was also the center of, a center for arts and entertainment. This open-air theater in Ephesus was large enough to seat almost 25,000 people at one time. I had a chance a few years ago to visit this site on one of our teams that went to Turkey, and I stood at the very top of that theater, and I could hear someone talking in this, uh, in this kind of voice on the stage 
clearly, every word. It was so well engineered, acoustically speaking. Ancient people knew what they were doing with regard to engineering. The theater is actually mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter 19. A riot broke out here when Paul was teaching and preaching in Ephesus because he was confronting the pagan worship of the goddess Artemis of the Ephesians, and the artisans who made little idols were all upset, so a riot happened right in that theater. It's a very famous place. Speaking of Artemis, Ephesus was famous for the great temple of Artemis in their city. Uh, This is an artist's rendition of what it might have looked like back in the first century. It covered a space greater than a football field, made entirely of marble, considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. All that remains today of that temple is this lone column standing in a field, which may tell you something about the great Artemis of the Ephesians. So Ephesus, in many ways, uh, was a very unlikely place for the gospel to take hold. A very unlikely place for a church to be planted, to grow, and to thrive. But that's exactly what happened, the New Testament tells us. In part because the Apostle Paul himself spent three years there earlier in his life teaching and pastoring this young church. And he considered it one of the strongest and most influential churches of the ancient world. Brief overview of Ephesians is the first three chapters are about a a theology of the gospel. What was the gospel? What is the gospel? Who is Jesus? What has he done for us? And the last half of the book, the last three chapters, are sort of a guide to practical Christian living in the world for us as individuals and for us together as the church. So with that as background, uh, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read the first 14 verses. Uh, There's a lot in here, but hang with it, and I'm going to try to unpack it after we read through. So Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. The word apostle, as Jeff taught us last week, means sent one. And by the way, there's a movie coming out this spring called Paul, Apostle of Christ, uh, made by Hollywood. I'll be very interested to see how they deal with the apostle Paul. To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace. That's his favorite um, salutation. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved." In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Whoa. 14 verses. Those are only six sentences in the way Paul writes. You probably know it's comma, 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 comma. It's like he's so full of these glorious thoughts and truths, he can't stop himself. So let's try to unpack this beautiful language. The first thing, Paul is reminding the Ephesian believers, again, living just 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, in the midst of a pagan empire, the Roman Empire, and he's reminding us first that we are chosen. We are chosen in Christ. When our children are young, most of us as parents develop a kind of bedtime routine for them. And for us, when our boys were growing up, it was bath time, story time, prayer time, and then lights out. And several years ago, a number of years ago now, I heard Bill Hybels, who's pastor at Willow Creek Community Church up in Barrington, tell a story of a bedtime ritual he had with his son who was very young at the time. He said he once he got his little son into bed, maybe four or five years old, Uh, He would say, if I could line up all the little four-year-old boys in the whole world in a big, long line, do you know who I'd pick to be my son? And this little boy would say, you'd pick me, Daddy? He said, yes, I'd pick you. 
And night after night, month after month, year after year, he would do the same ritual every night with his son. And then a time came when the boy was nearing adolescence, 12, 13 years old, somewhere around there. He started again one night, and his son interrupted him. He said, I know, Dad, I know. And he realized maybe that little boy phase was kind of coming to an end. So he said, oh, uh, yeah, I guess you do, but I guess you knew. Good night. And he went to walk out. And as he neared the door, his son said, Dad. He turned around and he goes, you can tell me again anyway. See, we never outgrow being chosen in love. We never outgrow being chosen in love. So Paul is saying here, verse 3, read, let me read it again for you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. He chose us before the foundation of the world. Now, that's a mind-bending thought. It means the God of the universe who spoke into existence everything that is, Genesis 1-1, from the vast expanse of billions of galaxies to every little bit and molecule and atom that makes up the DNA in every cell of your body, that same God knew you before the foundation of the world. From the very beginning of all things, he knew you before you were born. He knew you before you ever heard his name. More than that, he chose you before you ever chose him. And more than that, it says, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself. What does that mean? Well, first let's take on this word predestined. It's a fancy Greek word that means to preordain or to predetermine. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean we're somehow sort of like robots, automatons, that, that we are puppets in God's hand and what we, we have no choice in what we do? Well, not really. Because we know from reading the rest of the Bible that God has given human beings freedom to choose to honor and worship him and obey him or to reject his love. We see that right in the first couple chapters of the book of Genesis. And then he holds us accountable for how, whether or not we respond to his love. So that's not what it means. Sometimes we get all hung up in these heavy theological words like predestined, and we end up arguing about it, and churches argue about it. The whole denomination start over what they think the word means. But when it comes right down to it, what the word really means is that God is God. God is sovereign. That means he has authority and power to do whatever he wants. And that makes perfect sense. Who would want a God who is not sovereign? God is sovereign by definition. And in his sovereignty, he chooses to be the initiator of our salvation. In other words, when it comes to salvation, God always makes the first move. See, I think Paul's thinking about himself here. And his story. You know the basic outline of the story. Born Saul of Tarsus, a proud and arrogant man, a man who used his intellect, his education, his religious position as a kind of weapon in the world. We read his story in Acts chapter 9. He's on the road to Damascus, on his way to harass and arrest and persecute, and if need be, kill followers of Jesus because he saw it as a threat to his way of life and what he believed. And on that way, he was confronted by Christ himself in a blinding light from heaven, and he hears a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you? I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. And in that moment, God chose Paul, Saul. Saul became Paul. He turned his life upside down, inside out, turned it around, and made him Paul, the apostle, the sent one, the apostle of the gospel to the whole Gentile world. So by predestined, Paul is telling us that it has always been God's intent to save. Always. In Genesis, we read and find out that God chose to create human beings in his image for relationship with himself. But human beings rejected that relationship, fell into sin and violence. Then we read, uh, God chose to give his promise to a man named Abraham. Through you, I'll bless all the nations of the world. In Exodus, we see God chose to deliver his people from bondage in Egypt as a picture of his coming salvation. In the New Testament, we see God chose to demonstrate his love by sending his own son. We celebrate that at Christmas time. 
John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God chose to accomplish that salvation through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. And in that sense, God chooses all. God so loved the world, the Bible says. God has offered salvation to all, whoever believes in him, it says. But not all respond to that love. Now, I'm well aware that there are plenty of theologians and pastors who might explain predestined differently than I am doing right now. But this, to me, is the clearest understanding of the gospel. Paul says we are chosen. But then he builds on that by saying we are also adopted. Adopted. I did a little research, and in America today, there are about 135,000 children adopted every year. There are another 100,000 foster children in need of adoption every year. Worldwide, there are about 20 million orphans that could be adopted. Now, if you are an adopted child or you are a parent who has gone through the adoption process, you need to know that adoption is one of the most beautiful and powerful images in the New Testament to express and explain the gospel. The word Paul uses here is a word, a Greek word that means to make a son. Adoption in the ancient Greco-Roman world often took place when a family adopted a slave who was working for them, and it meant a complete change of status from slavery to freedom, from fatherlessness to a family. Historians also believe that in ancient Rome, uh, when a biological child was born to a family, that father had the option of completely disowning that child and just abandoning that child. It was called the, the, the power of the father. And we can't really un- comprehend that today, but a biological child could be rejected. However, if that same family adopted a slave, adopted a child, because they were choosing that child, the law said they could never, ever reject or disown that child. This is the image Paul is using for us today. And that child then, once adopted, had full benefits of the family. No matter when they were adopted, they had a full share in the inheritance of the father. So here's what Paul means by this image, adoption. It means in Christ we receive a new father. In Romans 8, Paul writes, For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, so no longer a slave. You've received the spirit of adoption as sons. The same word he uses here in Ephesians, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. We receive a new family, which is the church. We'll talk more about the church in coming weeks. We receive a new inheritance. See this right in Ephesians chapter 1. In him we have obtained an inheritance, he says. This is the promise of eternal life. Having been predestined according to the purpose, right from the beginning of all time, of him who works all things according to the counsel of will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So by using the word adoption, Paul is saying that in Christ, we receive a new identity. Now, this is terribly important for us to understand. Quite often, I think, those of us who uh, are Chris, call, believe ourselves to be Christians or have been around church a long time, so often we kind of reduce the gospel to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and go to heaven when you die. That's the gospel. And and that's true, but that sells the gospel way short because it ignores what Paul is telling us here. Because the gospel is, I have been chosen by God the Father from before the beginning of time. I've been adopted as his son. I am now a new creation, a new person with a new family, a new inheritance, a new identity. That means I no longer rely on my culture to tell me who and what I am. We live in a culture now that's constantly telling us who we are and how to find out who we are. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says I don't have to rely on the culture to tell me who I am. I no longer rely on my race or my gender or my education or my family or my my successes or even my failures to tell me who I am. The gospel tells me Jesus tells me who I am because I am chosen and adopted. 
The second thing Paul tells us here in this first chapter of Ephesians is that we are redeemed. We're chosen and we are redeemed. Let me try to explain redeemed. Uh, over the Christmas break uh, with one or a couple, a couple of my sons, I went, we went to see a couple of movies, kind of what we do when they're all home. And one of the movies we saw, which I'm not recommending necessarily, was a movie called All the Money in the World. It tells a mostly true story of the 1973 kidnapping of John Paul Getty III, who was 16 years old when he was kidnapped by Italian mafia members and held for five months for a ransom of $17 million. You may remember that story. And he was held for that amount of money because the kidnappers knew his grandfather was J. Paul Getty, at that time the richest man in the world. What makes the story really interesting is that J. Paul Getty, who was worth well over $2 billion at the time. Remember, this is 1973. He refused outright to pay the ransom. Not a single dollar for the life of his grandson. Only after the kidnappers cut off the boy's ear, this is a little bit gruesome, I know, and sent it to the family, did he agree to pay anything at all. Even then, only $2.2 million because that was the maximum amount he could get a tax deduction for. True story. In other words, despite his great wealth, he would pay as little as possible to redeem his grandson's life. Listen to what Paul says here, verse 7. In him, Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. Paul is giving us the very foundation of the gospel here. In him, that's Jesus, we have redemption. Now that's a fancy theological word that means to simply ransom, to buy back, to purchase our freedom. Through his blood, that's the price paid for our ransom. And what is purchased is the forgiveness of our trespasses, our sins. That's the gospel. But he's not done yet. There's one more sentence. He says, according to the riches of his grace. According to the riches of his grace. In the movie, J. Paul Getty, the richest man in the world, says he will not pay the ransom because he doesn't have enough available cash. That was his excuse. Sometimes I think we think God's a little bit like that. That, that he's only going to give us as little as he can get away with, because after all, we really don't deserve it that much. When you finally sort of get your act together, when you finally can prove you, you, you deserve it, then I'll give, you, I'll give you a little of my grace and a little of my goodness. In the ancient world, almost all the pagan religions worked that way. The gods were spiteful, and they punished human beings. Paul's saying the God of the Bible is not like that. There's no limit to the riches of his grace. And there's no limit to his willingness to spend his riches. It says he lavished his grace on us. This word lavish is a fascinating word. It means to overabound, to exceed the necessary, beyond the expected measure, and overflowing. It's a rich word. Let me try to illustrate rather crudely here. Say this, this cup here, say this represents your, your physical thirst. You're thirsty. You may be thirsty right now. I just put that thought in your mind. You'd like to go get a drink. And so I, this is, represents my supply of water. And I say, oh, you're thirsty. I'll give you some of my water. I'll give you, you know, enough to, to sort of wet your whistle and you won't be that thirsty anymore. But I, I'm going to save most of this because I might be thirsty later and might, somebody else might need my, my water. So I'll give you just that much. But say this cup represents your spiritual thirst, your need for grace, your need for forgiveness, your need for love from God, your Father. What is he willing to give? What is he willing to pay? He might say, I'll give you just as much as you deserve so you know that at least I know who you are. And if you really are good, I'll give you maybe a little bit more. That's not what Paul says. He says he lavished his grace on us. He just pours out and pours out and pours out. He's got way more than enough. And there's no end 
to how much he pours out. This is the story of the prodigal son that Jesus told. This is the son who spent his entire inheritance on wild and riotous and foolish living, and he comes dragging himself back home, and the father sees him coming from a long way away, and he doesn't point his finger at him and say, you blew it, boy, you blew it. I'm not giving you a single dime more. He doesn't give him a lecture about how he needs to pay it back by working in the barnyard. He runs to him and throws himself on him and puts a new robe on his back and gives him a ring for his finger and throws a party. This is the God who lavishes his grace on us just because he loves us. We are chosen, we are redeemed, and thirdly, we are sealed, Paul says. We are sealed. Let me try to explain that. Some time ago, a woman who was very new to our church and very new to her faith itself came to see me in my office at South Street campus. And almost as soon as she came in and sat down in my office, she started to weep. She couldn't even say a word. She just started to cry. Tears running down her face. So I handed her my box of Kleenex, didn't know what was going on. And she said, what's happening to me? I said, what do you mean? She said, every time I walk into this building, every time, especially I go into the sanctuary, this happens. I start weeping and I'm not sad. Can you tell me what's happening to me? I knew just a little bit about her story. And so I said, well, I don't want to scare you or freak you out, but I think I know what's happening to you. The Holy Spirit of God, who now lives in you as part of your faith, is whispering to your heart about how much he loves you, that he's chosen you, he's adopted you as his daughter, and you're weeping in joy. Verse 13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Paul here introduces the Holy Spirit. Now, just a little bit of a preview. After Easter this spring, we're going to do a whole series on the Holy Spirit. But in the ancient world... To seal something meant to uh, make a binding agreement, usually in the exchange of property. Uh, it usually involved a signet ring pressed into hot wax to leave a mark, a distinctive mark. Like this now belongs to that person who purchased it. In our world today, it would be a sort of a legal signature, signing a contract, getting a document notarized. Sometimes we even say, this seals the deal. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying that through the Holy Spirit, God is saying, I have chosen you, I have adopted you, I have redeemed you, paid for you, lavished my grace on you, you now belong to me. You're mine. When you come to faith in Christ, the Bible teaches, you receive three gifts instantaneously. You receive, first of all, the gift of salvation, that's eternal life. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that Paul's talking about right here, who enters your life and your heart, and you receive spiritual gifts. We'll talk about spiritual gifts a little bit later in this series. Sometimes that experience is emotional and powerful, like the woman that came in my office and couldn't stop crying, like the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. But other times, that experience is more like signing a contract. There's not much emotion to it, it's, but it's a done deal, and that's the point. Because God has not only marked us with his seal, the Holy Spirit, but he's given us a guarantee. And the word Paul uses for guarantee means deposit. So the Holy Spirit is kind of like a a down payment on our eternal inheritance, which God has already promised to us in Christ. So the Holy Spirit has sealed us, and nothing can break the seal of God. Nothing. Many years ago now, maybe 15, 18 years ago or so, a woman in our church after a service asked me if I'd be willing to visit her mother. I said, sure, what's the situation? She said, my mom is dying. And I need to warn you before you go to see her that she doesn't go to church, she doesn't believe in God, and she's not a very nice person most of the time. I said, well, I'm still willing, but would she talk to someone like me? And the woman said, yeah, she would. She said her mother had only come to church once that she knew of with her family. That was to our church, then called First Baptist of Geneva, uh, to a Christmas Eve service to watch her granddaughter play the bells. That's the only reason she came. But after the service, she said, I like like that young man up there who was in front. That that was me. It was a long time ago. (laughs) Then when her mother's doctors told her there was nothing more they could do to her, she had cancer, uh, 
this woman asked her mother, would it be okay if that, that pastor came to visit? And she was shocked when her mother said, yes, he can come visit. So we set up a visit the following week. I drive by her mom's house one day, and her name was Charlotte. She was 77 years old when I met her. Uh, she had lived a very hard and painful life. She had been widowed some years earlier, then battled cancer continuously for almost 10 years. Uh, lots of treatment, lots of pain. And Charlotte was a pretty tough character, I learned right away. She was angry and bitter about almost everything. She had a razor-sharp intellect. Uh, she had a salty way of talking. She'd swear right in front of me, just talking. That's how she talked. Just, just a tough character. But she still seemed glad that I was there, and she just told me some of her stories. So at first visit, I just listened for a while, and then I offered to pray for her, and she said, sure, you can pray for me. So I prayed for her. Asked if I could come back sometime. She said, yes, you can come back. So that began what would be like a six-month friendship that developed between me and Charlotte. On the second or third visit, I, when I was there, I noticed a stack of books on her coffee table, like six books. They were all about heaven in one way or another. I recognized some of the books. I'd read some of them. I was kind of surprised. So I said, Charlotte, uh, w have you read these books? She said, oh, yeah, my daughter keeps bringing them over. Uh, her daughter was trying to, t trying to help her mom. I said, well, have you read them? She said, I've read them. I've read some of them more than once. And then I said, it wasn't really the toughest thing to discern, but I said, well, maybe one of the things I can do when I'm here is we could talk about heaven, and maybe I can help you know for sure that someday you'll be there. And she looked right at me and said, oh, I'd like that. So we started talking about Jesus the next few visits. I, we just talked a little bit more. She knew nothing about the Bible, nothing about the story of Jesus, but she would ask questions, and she would look straight at me, and I would, we'd just talk a little bit every time, and I'd pray, come back again, talk a little bit. Finally, after about five visits or so, uh, I thought she might be ready to take a step of faith because, because she was clearly um, getting sicker and sicker, homebound now. So at home one day, I typed up a little prayer on my computer. I call it Charlotte's Prayer. Just a simple prayer of faith and salvation. Put it in her own words. Took it with me next time, and I said, Charlotte, I have, I have an idea. Um, I'm going to show you this prayer. We've been talking for months now, and if this is something you understand and want to do today, I'll help you pray this prayer. So she read it really carefully, and she looked straight at me with those steely blue eyes and said, I'd like to do that. And so we prayed that prayer. And that day, that moment... That afternoon, God sealed the deal with Charlotte. Charlotte only had a few weeks to live after that. She didn't have much time in this earthly life to grow into her salvation. She didn't have a whole lot of time to grow in her understanding of the grace that God had lavished upon her. But here's what Paul is teaching us. God had chosen her before the foundation of the world. God knew her long before she knew anything about him. God loved her even when she was an angry, bitter, and broken woman. And he desperately wanted to adopt her as his daughter. And one afternoon... Just weeks before she would pass out of this life, he did. Today, Charlotte knows her eternal inheritance. The question is, what about you? Do you know that you've been chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, sealed by the Holy Spirit? Do you know that nothing, nothing can ever break the seal of God? I hope you'll stay with us through this series from Ephesians. Will you bow with me as we close? Lord, how we thank you today for your word, this ancient letter, reminding us of who you are, first and foremost, but then also reminding us of who we are by faith in you. Thank you for choosing us in your love, for redeeming us by your Son, for sealing us by your Spirit who lives in us and who lives in this, your church. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As you leave today, if you didn't have a chance to drop off your little connection card and the offering plate, take it out by the Welcome Center. We appreciate that. And if today you would like to spend a few moments in prayer with members of our prayer team, maybe you'd like to open your heart to the lavish grace God wants to pour into your life, or maybe some other issues happening, just come up following the benediction. They'd love to spend that time with you. Receive now the benediction. May we go in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who chose us, adopted us, redeemed us, and has sealed us. Amen. Have a great day.